Hey, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Ingrid Matson, and I am coming to you live from London, Ontario, Canada, from my home. And here we are, just a, a few days past the middle of Ramadan, this blessed month that is giving us so many insights, so many blessings, such a feeling of connection to each other. Alhamdulillah. It's my honor to be joining you once again for this four-part series on ethical exemplars, Um al-Mu'mineen Aisha and Amir al-Mu'mineen Omar. Uh, this is the third of four lectures that we will be having. Um, Cambridge Muslim College is putting on this wonderful uh, series of lectures and reflections and insights this Ramadan, sowing the seeds. And I'm so grateful to them for doing this for all of the staff, the faculty, uh, the leadership of CMC at all levels. MashaAllah, it's just a wonderful opportunity for all of us to connect and learn. And it's my honor uh, to join the other lecturers this month. Uh, we ask you, of course, if you're enjoying these and you're, you're you have the ability to do so, to please do uh, contribute to CMC so that they can continue to bring you just so much uh, wonderful programming. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we have been speaking for two weeks about, about Aisha and Omar. And I brought together these two great you know, really towering uh, uh, members of the Sahaba or two great companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because I want us to have a look and see how, you know, very often we examine people one at a time, but we don't really get the picture, the overall picture of what's happening in the dynamics. And what really intrigues me about both of these two, as I've said before, is that they are two who are very, very close to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They were chosen by him for their special roles. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, married Aisha. Uh, the angel Gabriel had shown her to him in a dream. The Prophet Muhammad had prayed that Omar might be guided to Islam, and then Allah chose to guide Sayyidina Omar to Islam, to strengthen Islam. So he chose him for that strength. We see that both of them have these extraordinary qualities of, of uh, strength of character, bluntness, in deep intelligence, and of course, great love for Allah and his messenger. Sometimes their strengths can be their weaknesses. And that is where last week, we showed how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam helped nurture them, nurture them so that they used their strengths in the right way and that they did not go to extremes. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, did correct them when they were out of balance. And this is a great lesson for all of us that our strengths can sometimes be our weaknesses if we aren't in balance. So now we get to the third lecture, and I want to begin with the time when they find themselves now without the blessed prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he has gone to, their, to his Lord. We know that in his final illness, the blessed prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he chose, and he was very subtle about it. He kept asking his family, you know, where am I supposed to go tomorrow? Whose house should I go into tomorrow? And that's because he would um, alternate days with the different Uman Hatim Mu'minin. And they realized that as he was asking in this uh, subtle way that what he was looking for was to know when it would be Aisha's turn. And they uh, then of course said, decided among themselves that, that um, they would just let the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, go into Aisha's home. And he was then at peace and, and restful in her arms until he drew his last blessed breath. 
Now, in choosing to die in Aisha's home, the Prophet Muhammad knew that he would be buried in Aisha's home. And that's because he told her that prophets are buried where they die. And so when the Blessed Prophet died, he was buried right in Aisha's home. And this made her home a place of great sanctity for the rest of her life. Her home would be this important sacred spot that would play an important role later. So for example, when Sayyidina Umar was dying, he told the companions who he chose to gather together to choose one of them to be his successor, he told them to gather in Aisha's room. So that shows both her, the great respect. And of course he said, with her permission, with Aisha's permission, gather in her room. It shows the great respect that he had for her and also the sanctity of that space because the blessed prophet was, was buried there. That, that small interaction, that small request also shows that respect, that mutual respect that they had for each other. And this is another point I want to show is that we have these two, two great companions so close, uh, so close to the Blessed Prophet, each bringing their own particular capacity, strengths and qualities, a woman and a man, and they have such a deep respect for each other. Now, of course, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died, uh, we have this uh, extraordinary story um, that uh, about uh, Sayyidina Omar, and that is he was he was truly in shock. Someone he was away from the um, from the location, and let me just share my screen here. There we go. So he was away from the location, and when someone told him the messenger of Allah has died, he became immediately very angry. So this is his, you know, this is, these are Sayyidina Umar's initial instincts, because this was how he was shaped in this, this environment where he would be immediately on the defense if, if there was something threatening. It's almost a kind of trauma response, we would say today. And he was in shock and he denied it as happens when we're first in shock. He, and he said, no, that's not true. You cannot say that. If anyone says that, I'll chop off their head. So he was, he was very, very upset about this. And um, as he was you know, filled with emotion, it was Sayyidina Abu Bakr who came to him and uh, tried to calm him down, not by directly confronting him, but by reciting this passage of the Quran, 3.144, Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Other messengers have gone before him. If he were to die or be killed, would you regress into disbelief? Those who do so will not harm Allah whatsoever and Allah will reward those who are grateful. So uh, with that, Sayyidina Umar, now he realized this was true because the Quran is the truth and it brought him back to reality it took him out of his denial. And he said, it was as if, you know, that was the first time I heard that verse. How often does that happen to us when we, we know we've recited and read a passage of the Quran many times in our lives, but then something happens and suddenly we see that verse in a new light. We hear it or understand it in a new light, or it's almost as if we never heard it before. So it's just an extraordinary moment. And with that, now they were without the Blessed Prophet. Of course, what happens after that is that Abu Bakr is, who is Aisha's father, is um, chosen to be the leader, the successor to the Blessed Prophet, the Khalifa. And, um, and he rules for only a very short uh, two years, a little over two years. Um, it's a time where uh, the Muslim community, you know, just begins start figuring out how they are going to continue on, continue forward without the Blessed Prophet. And there are different opinions because the Blessed Prophet embodied many different capacities, many different leadership capacities. He was 
God's prophet, who was the messenger of Allah. And no one, you know, would be that after him. Although there were, there were some false prophets afterwards who claimed that, and that was denied immediately by the rest of the Muslim community, by, by uh, the majority of the Muslim community, except for those false prophets that no, prophethood would end. So no one could continue in that capacity. But what about religious guidance? To what extent religious instruction and guidance and making judgments? What about understanding how to apply and interpret the, the sunnah? Uh, what about political leadership? What about the, the what about making judgments? You know, all of these issues were to be decided, and over the next decades and over the next centuries, uh, these functions, these various functions, would be uh, institutionalized into the state, but would also pass down through various forms of knowledge, um, through scholars and through teaching circles. So um, when Abu Bakr was dying. We're just going to skip over that because we're focusing on, on uh, Aisha and Omar here. When Abu Bakr was dying, he had to make a decision about what would come after him and who would take care of his family and who would take care of the Muslim Ummah. And so he called in his daughter Aisha and Abu Bakr had a number of children. Um, who could uh, take care of his affairs. He had, uh, Aisha had a full, full brother, but Abu Bakr chose Aisha and gave her the, you know, laid on her the, the trust of taking care of his children because he had some younger children and taking care of the rest of the family. So this is really extraordinary when we think of it. Um, that Abu Bakr chose Aisha to be the trustee of his, of his estate, to be the guardian of uh, the children in the family, and to be the um, guardian of their interests, of their, their trustee of their, uh, of their wealth. Hold on for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to let you have a look at a little timeline. And there we go. Here is a timeline for us to have a look at. So, um, so when Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dies, he puts Aisha in charge of his estate and of his family. He chooses Aisha. And what about the Muslim Ummah after him. And this is where he calls in uh, Omar, Sayyidina Omar. And he chooses Sayyidina Omar to be in charge of the Muslim Ummah as his successor, the successor to the successor of the blessed prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Omar, of course, who is a very practical person, when he hears people saying, um, oh, you are the Khalifa of the Khalifa of, of the Messenger of Allah. He says, this is, this is just too complicated. He doesn't like this kind of, uh, it's, it's very awkward and a complicated and long statement. So he says, um, you know, just call me Amir al-Mu'minin. And that's where he gets that title. And so now we have, um, we are into the caliphate of Sayyidina Umar. So let's have a look here. This is the death of Abu Bakr. So these are Hijri years, if you look at this slide I'm sharing. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, dies in the year 11 uh, of the Hijra. Abu Bakr dies in the year 13 of the Hijra, so two years after that. Now, Sayyidina Umar then is the uh, leader of the Muslim Ummah for a little more than 10, year, or 10 years, about 10 and a half years. So we see until his, these are all, these dates are death dates. 
so until his death in 24. Today, we're mostly going to be focusing on the Khilafa of Sayyidina Omar, picking out some major points. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Aisha during this time as well. And um, next week, we'll talk more about Sayyidina Aisha, and we will talk about both of them uh, in particular in terms of their personal qualities, but also their legacy to the Muslim community. You know, what do we learn from them? What do we have from them? What did they, what did they, you know, grow that now we can, we can reap the harvest of that, and the Muslim Ummah does did uh, after that. So before I, I um, close the slide, I want you to notice the names of the mothers of the believers. So we have, in fact, uh, one of the mothers of the believers, um, Zainab bint Khuzayma, who dies in the year four of the Hijra, so before the Prophet Muhammad dies, peace be upon him. And then we have Maria, uh, Zainab. So those two die during the Caliphate of uh, Sayyidina Umar. Um, and then Um Habiba, Hafsa, Safiya, Maimuna, Sauda, Juwairia, and then Aisha in 57, and finally Um Salama in 59 or 60. So Aisha is, except for Um Salama, who lived a, an extra two years, is the longest living of the Um and Hatim Mu'minin. And so here is the one who the, the Prophet Muhammad spent the most time with really teaching and shaping and she with her tremendous amazing memory with her tremendous intelligence um that she has many many years so how many years does she live after the death of the prophet so over 46 years of the hijri uh, in of lunar years such a tremendous amount of time um, most of her life, she is living without the Blessed Prophet. And during that time, she is using that to be the one of the major carriers of the Sunnah in herself, in her teaching. Um, she be becomes one of the major jurists of Medina. Um, she is a, a focus, a center of khair, uh, uh, money is constantly being being distributed um, from her home. Um, people are being taken care of in her home, her home that is now that sacred place that is the burial place, not only of the Blessed Prophet, peace be upon him, but when Abu Bakr dies, he is buried beside the Blessed Prophet. So now she is living in that home with her father and with her husband and, and Prophet. Um, and so it's a site of increasing, you know, ever increasing sacrality. Now, um, this time, if we think about this, let's just begin just for, for a moment or two with, with Aisha and what this means now, uh, a young woman who is widowed and then she also loses her beloved father, who is also, you know, has been the, the, the leader, the Khalifa, the Khalifa of the Muslims. So this is a, another double loss. Uh, when she lost the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, she lost her husband and the Messenger of Allah. And when Abu Bakr died, she lost her father and the um, uh, Khalifa to law. The leader of the of the Muslim Ummah. It's it, it's a lot to take in, as anyone know who uh, has experienced loss. Um, but she has a, a great responsibility, and it's interesting. I was listening to a lecture the other day after <clears throat> after the death of <clears throat> of Prince Philip, and people were talking about <clears throat> how Queen Elizabeth had him as <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> had him as her supporter and her partner for so long. And they were comparing that with Queen Victoria, who, um, you know, she had, who very much loved her husband. And when he died, when Albert died, she went into such a, a state of deep depression that she was practically incapacitated for the rest of her life in her widowhood. 
she really did not have for most of that time, you know, the uh, the strength or the focus to go forward. And this is the the difference I think here we see with with Aisha. Maybe Allah may Allah be pleased with her. She deeply, deeply loved the Prophet. She deeply, deeply loved Abu Bakr. She like knew as well as everyone else that there would not be an, another messenger. That this is, you know, a huge uh, loss for for them. At the same time, they knew that this was Allah's will, and that what the Blessed Prophet had taught them was to worship Allah, not to worship him, to worship Allah and to follow his sunnah, um, which he set out according to, um, because he was uh, divinely guided to live that life. And so as difficult as it was, she was able to go forward. She was able to continue on and to continue to contribute for those many, many, many decades. And we owe her so much uh, for what she did for the Muslim Ummah, um, despite being in that position. Let's also think about something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to not um, have any of the sons who were born to the Blessed Prophet survive into uh, past very small infancy. So when the Blessed Prophet did have some sons, each one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them when they were very, very small children, even infants. And this was, you know, it was possible for Allah to decide otherwise. This is not an accident, of course. Um, all the things that happen in our lives and in the Blessed Prophet's lives are by, by the qadr of Allah and by the will of Allah. And not only do we know that in general, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in, us in the Quran that Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. So this means that Allah decided not to make him a father. So here we have the blessed prophet who um, is not having one of the, the blessings that, that everyone seeks in life. You know, every man wants to be a father and to have a son. Um, and the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided not to give that to the blessed prophet. And there's a lesson in that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the blessed prophet daughters whom he loved and cherished and showed respect to and ensured that others respected them as well. What about Aisha? A married woman typically would expect to have children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to not give her children, as was the case with the all of the other wives of the Blessed Prophet, except for Khadija and Maria and Qutiya, but Maria's son also died. So she was then left without children. So after Sayyidina Khadija, no woman who was married <clears throat> to the Blessed Prophet <clears throat> um, had children. That was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice. Now, what an interesting choice. What an interesting choice when we see how, how much emphasis is put on motherhood for women um, in society in general, in Muslim community, certainly. And of course, it is a, you know, it is one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it also can be a blessing not to have children if that is what Allah chooses for you. And Allah chose that for Aisha and Allah chose that for Hafsa, and Allah chose that for Sophia, and as we go on. So this is where their role as Umm al meaning mothers of the believers, is important to put side by side, that these great women had another role. They had a role to bring their caring, their nurturing, their love, their feeling of closeness, their feeling of wanting to... Um, to strengthen relationships among people, that they brought that to the whole ummah. And that is the case that, that women can do in every generation, in every generation and in every family and community, there are women who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses um, to uh, remain without children so that 
perhaps they can serve in other ways that women who might be busy with little children at home would not be able to do. Similarly, there are men who are denied also that blessing of children or of sons, perhaps so that they can demonstrate to society the blessings of girls, of daughters, or demonstrate that, that a man can also serve and be worthy uh, without uh, children. And that there are places when someone, when a person doesn't have children, there are perhaps some risks they can take, some places they can go to, some professions that they can undertake that would be very difficult to do if they had uh, children because it would be denying the rights of those children. So it's extraordinary. Now, when we think about how these things uh, work together. So before we move on to say Na'omar, I want to uh, uh, talk just a little bit more about Aisha and we will go far and far more in depth with her next week. But one of the things we spoke about earlier last week was that because Aisha was chosen by the Blessed Prophet, because Aisha was very explicitly chosen by Allah for the Blessed Prophet by bringing her, her image um, to the Blessed Prophet in a dream, um, Aisha had you know, confidence in, in her position. And she also was had some pride in that. And this is the thing that allowed her to stand up to those hypocrites and munafiqun in Medina who were trying to attack the Blessed Prophet through her or to try to attack the Blessed Prophet's family through her. So it was necessary that she had that confidence, but sometimes that could go too far. And sometimes she would be, um, uh, you know, because the Blessed Prophet loved her so much, sometimes she wished, wished wished that the Blessed Prophet loved her only. And of course, that's not what he was called to do. There's one story I want to mention, which is that, you know, when when we're angry, when we're, we want to hurt someone because we feel hurt by them, we try to look for the thing. And we don't, we don't necessarily consciously think about it, but our, our, let's say what we call now implicit biases, sometimes will come forward. And through those implicit biases or prejudices um, or teachings that we've had early in our life that are really not you know, very healthy or wholesome or ethical, those might come through in a moment of being upset or angry. And this is the case with, with Aisha, that one time when she was feeling very jealous of Sophia, she called her uh, al-Yahudiya. And she said it in a way, not an objective way, not a descriptive way, but she said it as if it were an insult, you know, oh, you Jewish woman, right? And Sophia, of course, was, was very hurt. And she came to the Blessed Prophet. And here's this, this wonderful um, way of teaching and support and care that the Blessed Prophet gave, which is that he tried to empower people. And so he said to Sophia, you know, why did you not say, why did you not say to Aisha, my father is Harun and my uncle is Musa. So what he did is he gave her the language to defend herself and to turn this so-called insult into a point of pride that she came from this great lineage of the, um, of the prophets, of the Israelite prophets. And she was married to a prophet. So this is, you know, a beautiful lineage. Now, um, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he also uh, chastised Aisha for being unkind um, uh, to Sophia. And what's amazing is that when Sophia does then die, and as I showed earlier in the, um, in the timeline, we see that um, Sophia will die during the year 50. So that will be after the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib, this is during the time of the Umayyad Caliphate. And at that time, there are those who, when Sophia dies and she is, um, her estate is being distributed, they find out that she had, um, she had written, she had given one third of her estate to her nephew, as is her right. Because as you know, it's permissible for a believer to give one third of their estate um, maximum 
to a um, uh, for a good cause or for to support a person. So as long as that, uh, as long as it's a good cause, and as long as that person is not a, you know, uh, uh, an enemy or uh, someone who is, uh, you know, hostile to Islam, that um, that it is permissible to give that third of the estate. Sophia gave it to her nephew. Her nephew was not a Muslim, he was Jewish. And he was, as a Jewish man, he was part of Ahlul Kitab. Um, you know, this, this extended family of faith that we as Muslims have. So we have our nuclear Muslim family of faith. We have our extended family of faith with Ahlul Kitab, Christians and Jews, uh, especially. And so there were those who, who came forward and they said, no, this money, which comes from the Muslim Ummah, it's never going to go to this person. And it was Aisha who stood up and she said, fear God, uh, fear God about Safiya's wishes and her rights, the rights of Safiya. She has a right to do this, fear God. And so it was Aisha's intervention that, uh, that made sure that Sophia's wishes were fulfilled. And so here we see her solidarity with the Umm al-Hatim mu'minin, just as we saw when we talked about the Diwan that Sayyidina Omar said. So if you haven't seen lecture one, you can go back to lecture one and see that when, when Sayyidina Omar sets out the Diwan and he sets out the stipends and the allowances that everyone is going to get and the Umm al-Hatim mu'minin are on the top of the list, Sayyidina Omar wanted to give Aisha a, a kind of bonus as it were, because she was so specially uh, loved by the blessed prophet. And this shows, this shows Omar's, you know, objectivity um, and lack of, he was always very keen to make sure that, that he, he, neither he nor his family benefited from his position as a min mu'minin. So he didn't, you know, he chose he wanted to give Aisha this extra stipend and not his own daughter, Hafsa, who was also one of the Umm al Mu'minin. So it really shows his, his principles, his ethical principles. May Allah be pleased with him. Uh, but Aisha denied that. A Aisha said, no, um, I I'm going to take the same as my sisters. So again, now we see that by the time the Blessed Prophet dies, Aisha has attained a state of maturity where she is now she has confidence, but she has withdrawn from, you know, she's not arrogant. She has confidence. She knows, she also knows her special place and that, that where she lives, you know, her home is the grave, the resting place of the Blessed Prophet Abu Bakr, but she does not want to be singled out over the other Umm al Mu'min. And so this is a great maturity that has set in with her now. Now, what about Sayyidina Omar? Sayyidina Omar, his caliphate is in these 10 years or so. There are so many things that happen that uh, we could have a, a class that is just on, uh, you know, a 10 week or 12 week class just on Sayyidina Omar. He does so much. It is really extraordinary what he does during his time. So let's focus on a few of his policies. And next week, We'll focus again. Um, I know last week there was a question about Omar and Zuhud and Tasawwuf. I think we're going to leave that for next week so we can get a little bit more deeply into that. But let's focus on his policies for the time we have today. So the first has to do with the conquest and, and the limits of war. Now, Omar's uh, caliphate is known for a time of great expansion of Islam. And for many people, uh, you know, many people who would look at this would say, well, this is just, you know, the purpose of the state. All they wanted to do was expand no matter what. But in fact, when we see, uh, uh, when we examine in detail Sayyid Omar's um, uh, correspondence and his orders to others, we see that uh, that is act actually not the case. He's very concerned to make sure that well, uh, it is necessary to, um, uh, to engage in war, to defend the Muslim community, that that is not a goal in and of itself. It is not the goal of the Muslim Ummah to, um, to engage in warfare. 
And he's very concerned that, that the companions um, do not fall back into the, the pre-Islamic way of a kind of hero worship. Because in the Jahili period, the most elevated person was the strong young warrior, right? They were the ones who were celebrated. They were the ones who got the girls. They were the ones who poems, not only were poems written about them, but they, 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 uh, they wrote poems about themselves and about their great exploits. And it, it's a, a dynamic that we see in any society that the, the charisma of the, uh, the you know, young, strong uh, male leader can lead to some problematic behaviors. And so Sayyidina Omar actually was very concerned about that. And one of the first things he did, in fact, the very first thing they say that Sayyidina Omar did when he became an Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the believers. So this is like, this is the, you know, commander of the believers in that sense even has a military sense. But what's the first thing he did? He removed Khalid ibn al-Walid, Allah, the sword of Allah. He removed him from his position temporarily. And people were outraged. How can you sheathe the sword of Allah? Like, how can you take him, take him off the playing fields, like your star, you know, football player, and you're just putting him on the bench for a while? Why did he did that? Because first he wanted to investigate some complaints that had been made to uh, say uh, against Sayyidina Khalid. And this is a theme that will go on and on and on in, in Sayyidina Omar's uh, caliphate is that whenever there's a complaint, he investigates it right, right away, no matter who the person is, you know, no matter how esteemed or respected he is. Anytime one of his governors or his military commanders or his judges, um, anytime he receives a complaint against any of those, he immediately investigates it. And the first step he does before investigation is he temporarily removes them from their position. So that if in fact they are doing harm, they can't continue in it, he investigates it. If the investigation shows that they did nothing wrong, he makes an announcement about that and will replace them. If they were doing something wrong, he can punish them and remove them from their position. So the first thing Amir al-Mu'minin does is to take his star general off the battlefield. He investigates him um, and eventually he puts him back um, in service once he has investigated everything and been satisfied that um, uh, with the limits that he's put in place that, uh, that uh, Sayyidina Khalid can continue. Um, Sayyidina Omar also, there are many reports that he is reluctant where he'll get, he'll get a letter or a missive from one of his commanders far in the field and they'll say, please give us permission to go ahead and continue into this territory or that territory. And many times Sayyidina Omar will, will engage in a discussion with them and he might refuse them and sometimes he will permit it for, for them. He, um, he, uh, he's very concerned about Muslims going into um, uh, naval battles on the ocean. He's worried about them being harmed. Um, and so he has this balance. He, he knows that war is necessary sometimes. Here you have this, this just, you know, fledgling Muslim ummah that is surrounded by these two, uh, you know, they were surrounded by these two historically great empires, Persian and Roman Empire. Um, and yes, uh, parts of them have collapsed uh, during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad SM and during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, but there are still people there. There are still, um, there are still those who are, uh, you know, parts of those who ran away to other places who are trying to attack the Muslims. And so he needs to engage in warfare to defend the Muslim community, but only if necessary. Um, and he wants to make sure that it's done right. So here, here's a here's a um, example um, 
Um, here's another example. Um, so once there was a, um, a delegation from Basra that brought news of a Persian revolt, and this was in the year uh, 17. And when he heard about the revolt, the first thing that Sayyidina Omar said is this, have the Muslims perhaps done harm to the people living under their protection? So rather than immediately saying, why are these people revolting? What's wrong with them, right? He says, wait, maybe the Muslims have done something to harm them. Maybe that's why they're revolting. This is amazing. You know, this is a sign of a leader. Rather than blaming <laughs> the people who are complaining as it were, he first thinks about those who have the power because in this situation, it is the Muslims who are having, who have the power over the, the Persians. So if they're revolting, have the Muslims been using their power incorrectly? Um, and he says, or have they perhaps done some things to them that caused them to commence hostilities against you? And Ahmed keeps asking these questions uh, of his commander until finally he realizes that the revolts will only stop. Um, the, the revolts are continuing because the Persian king is still alive and from a hidden location is inciting these revolts. So this is, this is really extraordinary. Uh, Sayyidina Ahmed, he would, um, you know, he would often, uh, one of the, uh, one of the historians says this, Sayyidina Ahmed held the conquering armies back out of concern for the lives of the Muslims. Had he allowed them to go anywhere they liked, they would have gone anywhere water was available. So we think about this as a time of, you know, great expansion, the great conquest, but that was not a goal in and of itself for Sayyidina Omar. And in fact, he restrained, uh, many times he restrained his, his generals, he restrained his governors for the sake of the safety of the soldiers. He did not want them rushing into places that were dangerous. And he wanted to make sure that, that it was absolutely necessary. And the first thing that he ever did always was to look at his own commanders. Were they doing something wrong? Now, uh, the second point I would like to discuss is Sayyidina Omar and, and women. I spoke about this uh, uh, last week and it's a theme of this talk because as I mentioned at the beginning of the first lecture, you can find in much contemporary um, literature about Islam, about Muslims, about the early Islamic period, very often uh, like very derogatory um, writing about Sayyidina Omar saying that he, you know, he didn't like women, he was harsh towards women, all of these things. And this is true. I mean, to some extent, it's true. We mentioned that last week and that where he had that harshness, it was the Blessed Prophet وسلم, who stopped him and who told him to not be harsh that way. So the Prophet was always, not only always saying that, but of course the Prophet was embodying a different way of being a Muslim man, a Muslim Arab man. The Prophet Muhammad never struck any of the women um, he never struck a woman. He never struck a child. Um, he himself said, um, uh, you know, he talked about that. He said that the best of you do not strike women. And so he was, he was regular in that message and talking about that and living that message. And it's quite interesting because in, um, in Sayyidina Umar's Khilafah, we do see, of course, he is, he is treating women like men as subject to the law. So there's the law and they're subject to it. But what's amazing is that a lot of his focus seems to be on um, controlling men, men and their desires, and men and their desires to use women 
however they would like. Now, why do I say that? I say that because two of the common criticisms of Almod that came from men of his period uh, was that he enforced a prohibition on temporary marriage. Sayyidina Almod enforced a prohibition on temporary marriage. So we know there's a hadith that the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, that he, um, that he uh, stopped and said, you know, temporary marriage no longer is, um, is lawful at the, after the Battle of Khaybar. Um, and, but enforcement, of course, at this time is very limited. There's no state, there's no state apparatus really in terms of um, uh, police or judges much less any kind of social uh, service infrastructure to see what's happening in people's families, right? So Sayyidina Omar, during his Khilafah, he enforced this ban on temporary marriage and many men complained and because they thought they should be allowed to continue this. Banning that temporary marriage was a way of really controlling men more than women because women were almost always the vulnerable partner in, in that temporary marriage. The second thing that he did that brought a lot of complaints is that he said, any um, um walid um, will be free even without her master's permission. What does that mean? Is that the um, there is a form of marriage of lawful intimacy between um, a man and ma'amanakath aymanukum so this is, uh, there's a lot of writing on this. It's a huge subject. I can't get into all of it. But what I want to say is that in that form of, of marriage is that, you know, and why do I call it marriage? I call it marriage because, um, uh, because that when there is that relationship, it is the man's responsibility to protect that woman from, from harm. He has to support her. He has to care for her. Um, any children she has are his children, fully his children. They are free and he supports them. And Sayyidina Omar said that, um, that it was not, um, you know, what many people thought is that a man should be able to acknowledge whether that child is his or not. Um, and Sayyidina Omar said, no. It is as long as there is evidence of intimacy between a man and the, the uh, uh, umwalid that she would be freed upon his death and she must be supported for his whole life. He can't give her away. He can't, he can't dissolve himself or divest himself of responsibility for her in any way. And there were many men who said, well, you know, you're restricting our rights. Um, and, and this was something that Ahmed was very strict on. Now, um, there were other companions who had different opinions and those opinions um, saying that, well, the man's acknowledgement of the child um, uh, is a condition for having that status. Uh, that went on, um, the Kufan jurist picked that up and uh, it became a position in one of the schools of law, but the majority of the schools said, no, he doesn't have that discretion. If he, if he enters into this intimate relationship, then he has to realize that he will have responsibility for his whole life. And why do I say any evidence of intimacy? Because in fact, Amr decided that the woman did not need to have a child because a woman came to him and she said, I, um, uh, this man entered into a relationship with me. Um, he, um, I became pregnant, but I had a miscarriage. Uh, the child did not, you know, I had a miscarriage, so she didn't go through a full pregnancy and give birth to the child. Um, and Omar said, you are an umwalid, and he must support you and protect you until the rest of his life. And so what's the significance of that? Well, it shows that it's not the child that's significant. It's that pregnancy, even if the pregnancy is lost, is evidence 
that there has been an intimate relationship between them. So, you know, otherwise it's very, how do you, how do you prove this? Um, and so Ahmed was very keen to restrict the, 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 how men felt about women and that they should be able to pretty much do whatever they wanted and that that was somehow their right as, as men. One, one uh, other example, um, some people came to Sayyidina Omar saying, our family is large and the burden is heavy. Why don't you increase our stipends? So they got a certain amount of stipend from the Diwan and they come to Sayyidina Omar complaining saying, oh, we've got, you know, we need more. And what did Sayyidina Omar say? He said, you are responsible for your own problems. From God's wealth, you have decided to marry many women and have taken on servants, that's your problem. So uh, again, we see that, that he's not, you know, he's not buying it. Um, and one final anecdote um, in, this, in this theme, there's an occasion during the Caliphate of Omar when a group of um, shepherds, um, not shepherds, but people who are on the outskirts of the city, they bring a woman and they say, this woman who's our relative she has engaged in unlawful intimacy with a shepherd. You need to punish her. And so Sayyidina Ahmad, and we know that he is very strict about matters of, of unlawful intimacy. But remember, he's learned a lot from the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's matured and he's deepened his understanding of many things. So he says to the woman, he takes her aside, he says, what happened? And she tells him his, her story. She says, I, I'm a shepherdess and I was out taking care of my flocks and I, I didn't have, I have a child um, from, um, uh, from a previous uh, marriage and I didn't have anything to eat. I was starving and my child was starving and then a man came and he said, he offered me three dates. And he said that he would give these to me if I had intimate relations with him. And what did Sayyidina Omar say? He said, mahar, mahar, mahar. So he, dis he judged that this exchange of dates uh, for intimacy was in fact could would be categorized as a marriage that the dates were the mahar for the marriage. Now, of course, um, you know the whole situation was horrible. But what he's trying to do at this moment, what he's doing at this moment, is preventing harm from coming to this woman, understanding her desperate situation, and finding uh, a legitimate way of of relieving her, of of getting her out of this situation. So, um, so well, I don't, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but I, I really do think that when we look deeper, more deeply into the, the evolution of Sayyidina Almaj's thinking, of his rulings that come over time, that he uh, really is not the person that many people make him out to be. He is just extraordinary, and he. He really deepens in his understanding of things. May Allah be pleased with him. I can't believe we're nearing the end of our time already. I'm going to take a little bit more to do one final, to talk about one final incident um, during his time as the Caliph. And then next week we'll get into more detail about some of his character and of course to Aisha and their legacy. But this is, um, this is his actions during the so-called uh, year of ashes, Amr Ramada, and this is in the year 18 of the Hijri. During that time, there was a drought, uh, a severe drought, and they called, the Arabians called this the year of ashes because it, everything just dried up and the ground looked like ashes. He, uh, people started coming into 
Medina, the Bedouin, because with the drought, the water holes dry up, the camels dry up, the Bedouin rely on the camel milk. Um, so the camels die, they no, have no, they no longer have any milk, they have no water. Um, and so they start coming in. Here's an, an anecdote. He says, uh, where one of the clans, um, they came uh, on the outskirts of Medina, had about 20 tents. And they were eat, eating broiled carrion skin and powdered bones. They had nothing. So they would boil, they would boil the, the skin of dead animals. They would find bones and boil them because they had nothing. They were starving. They were completely emaciated. So Ahmed went out and he cooked for them. Uh, first, he cooked for them. He fed them. He and another of the companions asked them. They went out. First, they fed them a little bit to give them a little bit energy. Then Sayyidina Almud brought camels and he placed them. He put, picked them up and put them on the camels and he brought them closer into the city. And he kept them there. He gave them clothes and he brought food and he visited them regularly until the drought ended. But that was just one small group. There were in fact many hundreds, in fact, thousands that came to Medina that were starving and emaciated, the men, the women, and the children. And so in addition to feeding them during this time and giving them what they needed, uh, Sayyidina Almud, he wrote to his, um, his generals and his governors in Egypt and in Syria saying, the believers are dying, we need your help. And he was waiting for them to send um, grain, to send food back to Medina. Eventually they did. And Sayyidina Almud said, if they had not done so, I would have placed one of these, what we would now call climate refugees, um, in, every, in the home of every one of the believers. Because where there is enough food for three, there's enough for four, where there's enough food for two, there's enough for three. So what he's saying is that he would have forcibly placed them in the households of the believers and had them um, feed them and take care of them until the supplies came. But what did he do? Not, did, he not only did policies, but he did something personally. And this, is, this is really shows the person that he is. May Allah be pleased with him. Sayyidina Ahmed, he swore an oath that he would not taste butter, milk, or meat until people found the world once more covered in herbage from the first rains. So he, during that year, he was eating just some oil and bread, oil and bread until the point where he got a stomach ache and he had a constant stomach ache that year, but he wanted to show solidarity in a tremendous disaster, when there is a major disaster, yes, you, it, your own food may be lawful to you, but, but what about their feelings? You know, he didn't have to deny himself those things because he was providing them with other things, but he denied himself those things as an act of solidarity to show them, I am with you. And this really is the, the great, tremendous person that Sayyidina Ahmad is. May Allah be pleased with him. Now, although we're going to talk more about him next week, let me just, just end um, here today with a note about his death. When Sayyidina Ahmad was, um, uh, was struck uh, by Abu Lu'lu'a and, and was stabbed many times with him by him, and he knew that he was dying. He lingered for about three days before he died of the stab wounds. So um, he he spent that time arranging, you know, his affairs. Uh, one of the things he did, as we know, is he at first he was going to appoint a successor as Abu Bakr had done with him, but he said he didn't want that burden and that responsibility. So what he did is he chose six people who he had heard the blessed prophet promising paradise. 
So these were six of the companions who had been promised paradise by the blessed prophet. And he gave instructions for them to meet in Aisha's room and with many detailed instructions for them to be able to go through a process where they could choose among themselves one of them who would be his successor. And then he sent a message to Aisha and he asked her, he said, would you please allow me to be buried beside my two companions, meaning the blessed prophet and Abu Bakr. Now, of course, we could imagine that Aisha would have thought that would be her space, right? Beside her husband and prophet, beside her father. Um, but she had such respect for, for Sayyidina Umar. She did not want to deny him. And she agreed that she would allow Sayyidina Umar to be buried in her home. And, and she did that. And she decided then when, when she was dying many years later that she would be buried with the other Umar Hat and Mu'minin again, showing how she had over time um, developed this, you know, had gone from a certain amount of insecurity and jealousy to confidence and a sense of generosity and wanting to show that kind of solidarity. May Allah be pleased with her. So we still have much more to do um, next week, but this will be the end of today's talk. Uh, I'm going to look at the questions that you may have um, put in, and we're going to look at that. Before I take um, those questions, um, I want to just read uh, something, an appeal from CMC that they sent me. So um, they're appealing one for so-called seed stories. So CMC is taking submissions from our audiences of seeds they've grown in the past, present, or plan to in the future, perhaps a good habit they cultivated, perhaps a class they started, perhaps they're planning to start you know, a soup kitchen for the, for the needy, anything that there is. So you can follow um, their instructions for this and they'll give you a, a, a link for that. So that's the first, submit your seed stories. Second, please provide feedback. There's a feedback form so you can um, tell CMC what you thought about the Ramadan live sessions. So that's the second appeal. And the third appeal is of course, that, um, that you contribute to this. Um, there's a short video called What We Can't Do, uh, parenthesis, without your help. And um, that is where you know, CMC is um, respectfully asking for your support so they can continue to undertake the wonderful programming that they do. So, so when we're done here today, maybe you could look for that um, short video, What We Can't Do Without You, and be able to um, provide some um, some support to CMC. Now, let me have a look at the questions. I don't see any yet. Let me see if there's a, let's see. Okay, there we are. Okay, the question is this, though we consider the Sahaba great and blameless due to their station with God, we recognize the social historical context and culture in pre-Islamic Arabia. Many non-Muslims may be consternated by the behavior of Sayyidina Umar before he became Muslim. So how do we deal with the critiques of Sahaba during the Jahiliya? Um, well, yeah, or I mean, I would say, how do we deal with critiques of the Sahaba even after they became Muslim? Because they were the best generation and they were fallible, right? And so, you know, what is the role of critique? First, I would say in terms of their behavior before the Jahiliya is that, I mean, who among us does not want the opportunity to change and to correct our wrong behavior and to reform ourselves? I mean, it's very sad if we have such an essentialized view of people that something that they've done in their life that's wrong is, is somehow 
you know, stains them for the rest of their life. That's not, that's not our belief as, as Muslims. And I don't think most people who are from other faith traditions or communities uh, would also want to deny the possibility of reform, um, of change, of growth. We all want that as human beings. So the question is, how do we create the environment to support people so that they can begin to understand themselves, so that they can have the, the support, the strength, the knowledge to be able to move towards uh, more change. And then when it comes to um, mistakes or, or critiques of the Sahaba, you know, after they are blessed companions of the Prophet Muhammad, of course, there's much that we don't know. I, I've mentioned before the problem of historiography, meaning that when we look at different historical accounts, the question is which are true and which are not, which are tenden tendentious, which are sectarian, which are, you know, just someone, you know, having an ax to grind. And so they narrated this. So this is why we have to be very careful with historical accounts. Think about how exquisitely we comb through reports about the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what a challenging discipline Hadith criticism is. Well, what about, what about critiquing these narrations about the companions where there is not a similar uh, robust um, um, intellectual apparatus to sift through those. So we have to be very careful. And this is why we withdraw judgment on matters that, you know, if there's reports about secret conversations or hidden intentions or motives, you know, we can't, we can't have anything to do with that. But if they themselves mention their own, you know, a flaw that they had and that they changed, it's that transparency that is beneficial for us. So we can relate to these companions and we can say, you know what, maybe I should look for my flaws too and work on them and realize that, that I need to have more of a balance that I need to change as well. Um, yes, okay, there are some people who want some sources and I can gather those sources perhaps and have them ready for next week because I would have to, to pull them up now. Um, so I can do that. A number of the questions are, are about sources. So I will do that. And then there's a question um, from Rizwan Muhammad from Toronto. Assalamu alaikum Rizwan about uh, Umul Mu'minin Aisha's approach to teaching. Um, are there examples of how she taught people and demonstrated her ethics and how she taught? Absolutely. And that is what we are beginning with next week, in fact. So thank you for asking that question because um, it is, it is uh, something that really fascinates me is in particular, just to give you a, a taste of what will come, is the extent to which uh, uh, Umm Mu'min and Aisha um, uh, embodies her ethics and uses her own physical body as, a, as evidence of how things should be done. And it's quite extraordinary when we think about the kind of misogyny of, of the Jahili period and some of the misogyny that will enter into some parts of Muslim cultures from the Hellenic tradition, you know, associating women. It, there's this view that will emerge of a, of a dichotomy between matter and spirit and a degradation of matter and associating women with matter and the male uh, principle with with spirit, and that is not an Islamic. It's not a Quranic. It's not a. Uh, it's not grounded in the Sunnah. It's not grounded in the Quran, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who is the Creator of all things, created, made the creation good and wholesome, and that includes our bodies, as long as we use them in the right way, um, and within the limits set by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So I'm I'm really excited to have the opportunity once more next week to join you for our final in this four-part series on Umm and Mu'minin Aisha and Amir and Mu'minin Omar. Uh, I pray that uh, you continue to enjoy the blessings of Ramadan. I pray that you continue to um, reach out to each other during these difficult times. Think about how you can expand your circle, how you could be present even if it's not 
possible to be physically present with others, but to, to make your presence known and provide that uh, caring and compassionate um, uh, uh, relationship for those in our community. We all need that. We all need, you know, we're all a little bit feeling lonely and isolated. We all need those uh, those people who will reach out to us <clears throat> even, even and perhaps most in our prayers. So pray for each other. Thank you for your attention today. We'll see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.